Okay, so we are up here. We are, all right, hello, 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 hello. We made it to another live class. So I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Uh, today, as we like continue to build out, we're going to be talking about some other stuff. And again, so far, like we've been slowly building out as far as, you know, from smaller systems to subcellular out to um, bigger things, right? Bigger systems. We've talked and we've thrown some other stuff in between. We've talked about uh, travel guides and tips, which is on the blog. If you want to check that out, we talk about goal setting, which I think is really important. And I think where most people really get caught up. Um, but today we're talking about the lymphatic system because without proper lymphatic drainage, it's going to be really tough to consistently be healing. Um, and a lot of folks, even in like the functional space, like don't really talk about, it. and here's the interesting part. So of the extracellular fluid, so the fluid not found in cells in the body, 80% of it is actually lymphatic fluid and only about 20% of it is blood. And even if you were actually to like take blood it, it itself apart, 40-ish, 44, 45% of red blood of uh, blood is actually red blood cells. 1% of it, if you were to spin it up in a centrifuge, would actually be platelets and white blood cells. And 55% of that is plasma. So that's uh, water and structured water. It's ions, it's proteins, it's nutrients, it's wastes, it's, it's all these other things that make up the fluid that flows in our body. And if you want to talk about like lymph and blood flow specifically, I did a blog on it in the past. I'll put a link in this week's blog if you want to check it out. Um, but the lymphatic system is really important because it actually filters a lot of blood. So like, for, or a lot of fluid. And to put it into context, like say if you have 10 liters of blood that flow from arteries, they end up, they end up going through capillaries and into what we call the interstitial space, the, the tissue, the space in between the tissues. That's all with fluid. So for every 10 liters that go through, only 8.5 go back into the bloodstream. So that extra 1.5 liters is actually picked up by the lymphatic system and then essentially cleaned, right? And, and that's what the lymphatic system is, is doing. And, it, and it's responsible for filtering waste and absorbing fats from the intestines. That actually happens in the lymphatic system. It releases things like lymphocytes, which are a type of white blood cell, which are located in the lymphatic system, mostly in lymph nodes, lymphocytes, right? B lymphocytes, T lymphocytes. That's where the, that's where you're going to find them. And it's only if that th this system is, is flowing and functioning properly that we're going to get ideal um, waste removal in the body. And that's really kind of where you know we're at with the lymphatic system and why this is so important. And I think for most people. It's making sure this is flowing, making sure it's working as well as it should, should be, I think, step one for a lot of people. And, and there's a lot of a lot of the stuff we talk about is going to help with that anyway. But we got to talk about like a little bit of how the system works. Right. So how does this waste removal, this lymphatic system work? There's really two different types of waste that we come across in the body. We have digestive wastes, which are pretty self-explanatory right there. You eat food, you know. You bring it into the body. We take what we need from it. That that happens in the intestines. You absorb the vitamins and minerals and other nutrients that you need. And then whatever is left over gets excreted, right? Through urine, through sweat, through stool. Um, that's how you're going to get rid of it, through breath. Cellular wastes are a little bit different, but the function is actually the same. So just like we eat food, Cells need to eat certain things for, for them to survive, right? And it's the same concept. This is why, again, when I continue to mention that nature is fractal, this is what this is exactly what I mean. So just like we eat food, cells need food to, for them to function. It's the same concept on a smaller scale. And just like us, they use things. They, they utilize these things. And then there are metabolites that need to be eliminated. 
So they bring things in, they use the input for whatever they need to create energy, to create proteins, to perform a specific function, whatever it is. And then whatever's left needs to get eliminated. And that's what the lymphatic system's doing. So just like the di our digestive tract eliminates our food waste, the lymphatic system eliminates our cellular waste. It's the same concept, just on a smaller scale. Now, this is why I talk about the kidneys a lot. And this is also why, again, I think like, similar to the lymphatic system, the kidneys don't get a lot of love in this like holistic alternative space. And you'll see like a lot of folks still push high protein diets, which do tax the kidneys um, and all these other things. And, and a lot of folks have impaired to some degree kidney filtration. Now, when we talk about blood pressure, when we talk about heart disease, when we talk about diabetes um, and all these other things that most folks tend to perish from, if you live a standard American, standard Western life, impact the kidneys in some ways. Uh, or the kidneys affect them. So for example, blood pressure, most people forget that part of what the kidneys do is filter blood and, and regulate blood pressure. And it, they're also a sensor for what's going on in the blood. That's why the adrenals are located right on top of the kidneys. So from whatever the kidneys are picking up, they can actually take whatever mineral corticosteroids, glucocorticosteroids, sex hormones, that are going to come from the adrenals, that, that's going to be picked up partially by the kidneys. They act as a sensor system for this. Uh, the kidneys also are, are also going to play a role in producing red blood cells. That's part of what they do. They produce something known as erythropoietin, which helps stimulate the growth of more red blood cells. Now, what can cause problems for the kidneys? That Now, generally, and again, if you go back to what we talked about last week, low voltage, low pH, right? More acidic environment. When you have a backup of acids that are not being released from either damage or from um, just simply uh, living a more acidic, again, standard American lifestyle, this buildup can manifest in a variety of ways. It could be pain. It could be swelling. It could be tissue damage. It could be pimples. It could be cysts. It could be rashes. It could be tumors. There isn't one way. We, we have names for all these things, but the, the, the reasons are more or less the same. Now, this is why, again, I think iridology is really cool and important because generally we all have strengths and weaknesses and 10 of us can be exposed to the same stimulus and 10 of us do not have the same reaction. It could affect someone's knees. It could affect someone's skin. It could affect the way someone breathes. It could affect someone's blood pressure. It could affect someone's blood sugar control. Same stimulus, but we react different because we have different strengths and weaknesses in individuals. This is one of the problems with conventional medicine is that we're looking for this cause and effect relationship, but cause and effect is not, that, that's not how nature works. That's not how it works for most things, barring acute, obvious, traumatic events for the most part. Right, Berg? Exactly. Um, so that's a big part of it. Uh, and, and a lot of it starts again with how this lymphatic system is flowing. So again, it, there's kind of two major fluid systems that we talked about in the body, right? We have the blood system and we have the lymphatic system already mentioned. The blood system is, is, is about one fifth of that. And the other four fifths are made up of the lymphatic system. Better way to look at this is, is two parts of your house. Think of your body as a house. You have different rooms for different things. So the kitchen is where things are prepared and then brought out to bring things to cells, right? So the kitchen in this analogy would be your, your circulatory system, your heart, your blood, that's going to bring oxygen, that's going to bring nutrients, that's going to bring glucose to the cells that need it at a given time. Those cells are going to eat their meal, right? Just like I would sit down and have dinner or you would sit down and have dinner. Then whatever's left over needs to be gotten rid of right in some way and this is where the lymphatic system comes in so this in, in this house it would act it would be the analogy would be your bathroom or your septic tank or your sewer system in general so you know you don't necessarily want to be eating your mat your meals you wouldn't eat your meals you know in the bathroom right it, it's literally like you know you don't uh crap where you eat this is literally 
this is again microcosm versus the macrocosm it's the same thing and, and when you live a more standard american traditional lifestyle you quite literally tend to continue to crap where you eat on, on just on a smaller scale and that's really like what is happening with the lymphatic system when you overburden it it can cause some issues. So, so first we have this lymphatic fluid, and this is obviously different than blood. It's a translucent fluid, so it doesn't really have a color to it, um, and it carries the waste in this septic system. Now, you some people might call this plasma. That certainly is a name you can use. Um, but there are certain things that that can uh, you could find in it. It could be excess or unused proteins that you're going to get rid of, salt and ions, different gases, urea, which is obviously a big part of urine. Uh, toxic metabolic waste, uh, fats, like I said, uh, fat metabolism actually largely happens through the lymphatic system. Fats have to travel through that. Glucose, hormones, steroids, enzymes, uh, parasites, fungi, yeast, viruses, mold, like all of that is going to uh, be found in the lymph system. Also with, like we talked about before, different types of white blood cells like macrophages or monocytes or T and B cells. All of these are going to be in the lymphatic system. So when that's backed up, when you're not cycling through these things that you have to get rid of as effectively as you could, this manifests in a lot of different things. It could be, like I said, skin issues. It could be fatigue. It could be blood pressure issues. It could be immune system issues. So this could be something like swollen uh, lymph nodes. It could be um, or tonsillitis, especially in kids. This could be chronic, quote unquote, infections. Where, you know, if you get sick, three, four, five, six times a year, that's what's going on. Cir circulatory issues, lymphedema, so swelling, joint pains, uh, poor detoxification, again, in the liver, in the kidneys, in the uh, bre poor breathing patterns, accumulation of toxic material. That includes things like metals or what we call autoimmune type symptoms. All this stuff can be part of that system. So, or can be due because it's, it, it's sluggish, right? Now, lymph vessels run essentially parallel to veins and arteries. So while we have nodes in certain areas, and we'll go over those in a second, uh, they generally trace the circulatory system. So wherever you find arteries and veins, you generally are going to find lymphatic vessels too. And they, they're, they're also kind of like veins in a way in the sense that they're, 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 they go in one direction, right? Um, they don't have valves necessarily, but they're blind ended. So it, so they're going to feed into that and lymph vessels go to lymph nodes, uh, which are, and, you know, and filtering organs and, and the, and the things that are going to do the filtering are going to be things well, like the lymph nodes themselves. They certainly can do it. The appendix, the spleen, the liver, the tonsils, all of these are going to help, uh, recycle, this material that is either unused or needs to be disposed of in an effective way. There's other types of uh, lymphatic tissue that we call mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. So this is again in the limp, in the tonsils, but also can be in the intestines. So some people will call it GALT or G-A-L-T, gut associated lymphoid tissue. That's where most of our lymphatic system is. Uh, roughly 70, 80%, depending on where you look. It's actually right around that gut lining. Why is that? That's the interface between the outside world, if you will, and the inside world. So most of all those immune factors are going to be at that interface because that's where um, it we interact with the outside world. Uh, now, again, the main ones you could find, you know, in the neck, in the ax, in the armpits, in the, there's axillary nodes. You can find there in the groin area that we have things called inguinal nodes. And again, you can probably just look this up with the Google search. You'll see like where the larger nodes are. Those are where, where they're called. There's med there's some in the mesentery or the abdominal area. And again, that's where most of it's going to be. And that's why, again, when you see a an appendicitis or a tonsillitis, and these doctors are very quick to cut out tonsils or the appendix, if it's actually just inflammation, you know, you need to ask why. Usually it's not going to be something that you do once and it, and it uh, you know, disappears and that's it. There's usually a reason 
that this stuff is getting inflamed in the first place. And it's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to hopefully the doctor to, to, to understand that and not just go to, okay, we're going to cut someone's tonsils out at age four or five. And now they're literally not going to have immune system tissue that they would have had otherwise for the rest of their lives. And that's why you see studies where, um, those who had their tonsils removed early in life, like before age six, seven, tend to be uh, more prone to things like obesity. Uh, But again, you have all of these organs and such for a reason. Um, You know, nothing is optional. Nothing is, you know, accidental or uh, even the name appendix, like kind, kind of makes it seem like it's not important or, you know, arbitrary or you don't need it. That's really important immune immune tissue that actually helps repopulate a gut after, say, like a bout of like diarrhea that's trying to flush garbage out. That's part of what the appendix does. Now, again, conventional medicine doesn't necessarily look at it like that. So that's a big problem. Uh, so removing tissues. Again, you want to keep as much of your body as possible. That's important. Uh, the spleen, thymus, really important. So that's where... Uh, T cells. So we have T cells and B cells. T cells originate in the thymus, hence the name T cells. Um, B cells come from the bone marrow. So that's why they're named T and B cells. If you want to keep a thymus strong, like certain things that can be helpful are are vitamin A or retinol rich foods, vitamin B6, vitamin C rich foods. They're all going to be really important for supporting that. Uh, the spleen is technically the largest lymphatic organ. Um, it, it's really responsible for producing white blood cells. It helps destroy cellular debris, recycle old dead, old red blood cells um, and platelets. It creates bilirubin, which is actually which from hemoglobin. And some of that we use, some of that gets excreted in bile. So it just kind of depends on what the body needs at a given time. Um, The spleen is also a a reservoir for extra blood, so it it will hold on to some in case of an emergency. Um, And and when exact, for example, if you're bleeding, the spleen can can release some of that blood to prevent a potential shock. Uh, So so that's really important. So things that can support the spleen, vitamin C rich foods, black seed oil is actually really great for that, but vitamin C rich foods, mangoes, peppers, Cherries, berries, uh, broccoli, all these things that are rich in vitamin C. You can literally just Google a list. Uh, Fantastic support for that. Um, What else? Oh, so the the other way. So how do you check this is like kind of working as well as it should? Well, believe it or not, checking your urine is actually really helpful. So I I talked about this again, I think last week. As far as uh, filtering, you could certainly buy some... Uh, litmus paper, which is super straightforward. It, chances are, if you have a pool, you probably already have litmus paper. Ideal urine pH is going to be about 6.5. It's going to be roughly about 0.8 below what your cellular pH is. So again, that's usually going to be between 7.35 and 7.45. So minus 0.8 is going to be like ideal. That's where you want that to be. Obviously, the lower that is, the more acidic it is, uh, the higher it is, the more alkaline it is. And that gives you a general idea of what's going on at the cellular level. Um, it's certainly not diagnostic per se, but it is, I think, a really nice, easy way uh, for people to get an idea of where they're at. You could certainly do it for saliva as well. Um, I find urine is, it tends to be an easier one to do because you could kind of do it daily and, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, so as far as unclogging the drains, how do you get the lymphatic system moving? How do you get it moving? Well, I kind of gave it away a little bit. Movement in and of itself is going to be step one. And this is why, again, you don't need to be a power lifter or, you know, a world-class athlete, but you have to do some kind of movement every day, particularly with the lower body, since you have to pump that stuff up against gravity. So, you know, if you work, you know, a sedentary job or you're at a desk a lot, you have to make it a point to get up every so often and walk. You have to make it a point to be as active as possible. There is no replacement for movement, especially because 
the lymphatic system does not have a pump system like the heart. It, it the pump is muscle muscular contraction. So and muscles are always shortening, lengthening, depending on, on for any movement. So the more movement you have, particularly in the big muscle groups and the small ones too, but those are going to get a lot of movement, and especially in the lower extremities. So got to move. This is why walking is really important. You don't necessarily need a rebounder. Rebounders are nice. Um, I think, you know, if, you, if you're super sedentary and haven't done anything in a while, maybe a rebounder is a good place to start. But walking is great. Jump rope is great. Literally any movement, but you have to do something that's getting you up and moving. Um, you also want to do things that aren't going to constrict vessels. So the big ones are caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. Not surprisingly, these are going to be things that 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 constrict vessels. So you know you don't want to be regularly using things like alcohol, nicotine, and or caffeine. Because they're going to constrict these vessels when that when you have a smaller area to to flow through, you're not going to get as much flow as well, and you can get some backup. Uh, magnesium. So magnesium rich foods is really important. Um, most Americans tend to be magnesium deficient. Uh, where do you find magnesium? It's really in all fruits and vegetables, and again, that kind of coincides with the fact that um, like ninety ish percent of Americans don't even get RDA levels, which are, in my opinion, very low of fruits and vegetables. It's that simple. I, I, and to be honest, like the, the the conversations we have on the Internet with a lot of folks on this, um, you know, what to eat, what not. Some of these conversations are so idiotic and myopic. They just miss the, the, the blatantly obvious stuff. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, the, the poor quality oils, the heated oils, the. The rancid oils, the cotton oil, the, the rapeseed or canola oil, um, the corn oil, all this stuff that's heated and, and treated with hexane, really going to damage your mitochondria, really going to damage your cell membranes, going to use up a lot of that nutrition you bring in. So even if you know, you're know you replacing it, you still have to cycle this stuff out. So, so getting rid of it is the best answer. Circadian health. Um, this is a big one because guess what? When do you do most of your detoxing? It's when you sleep. So those with poor sleep, with poor sleep, or those who uh, force themselves to sleep with things like medications, or um, you know, even herbal blends on a regular basis. Like if you have poor sleep hygiene, it is going to affect how you feel, and it's one of, if not the most important things, and most people overlook it or, or don't take it seriously enough or or really know how to fix it. I got a whole book on how to do it, and it's very straightforward. Um, you know, you can check it out. It's in, you know, the link in my bio, what have you. Uh, again, other things you don't want to add to the burden, right? Heavy metals, uh, commercial hygiene, beauty products, herbicides, pesticides. So foods with these, products with these, you want to avoid. Uh, lymphatic massage. So some of these can be helpful. What I will say is like, you definitely want to focus on the areas where the large nodes are. And these are things you can do yourself. So, um, in this week's blog, I'll actually have a link to a YouTube video by, uh, Dr. Perry Nicholson, who you might see here on Instagram. He's, I think it's called stop chasing pain is his account. And he has some protocols you can use to get lymph moving by, you know, self-massage techniques. These aren't anything that's – and it's super easy to do. You could do them in probably like two minutes. Um, it's a good place to start. Again, doesn't replace movement, doesn't replace a lot of the other stuff we, we've talked about. But these are all basic things, especially if you're getting started off, you know, where you'd want to go. Some herbs that could be uh, uh, helpful for the spleen, for the lymphatic system in general. So uh, I, I'm just going to list these off. Again, they're going to be in the blog, so don't worry about it. But uh, dandelion, golden seal, cleavers, marshmallow, echinacea, grapeseed, burdock, astragalus, uh, slippery elm, fenugreek, calendula, licorice. Uh, you know, all of these are beneficial for the lymphatic system. Again, herbs, I think, in my opinion. Yeah, the big six, exactly. Yeah, that would be a, a he. I, there's going to be a video in this blog to one of his videos on that. So for for sure, 
Uh, some of the blends that I've used to help support the lymphatic system. And again, this is after doing that stuff that we talked about. Uh, a lot of these by Mediherb I like. So Burdock Complex, Dermaco, Echinacea Premium. Uh, there's one called Allergy Co., which... I think it's for more, I would use it in a more in an acute situation. So if you're actively, say, sick or something like that, that that's a good one. Uh, there's a few others too. I'll have the full list on there. But those are the big things you want to do for the lymphatic system. It's really about movement. It's really about getting the toxin or avoid, not even avoiding, getting rid of the things that you would do daily that would slow this stuff down and then increasing the alkaline food intake. And that's, it's very straightforward. Like, don't overthink this. It's more fruits and vegetables. And ideally, if you could get raw, great. I understand it's the winner. If you want more cooked stuff, fine. That's great. I'm totally for that. Um, but, you know, you, I think still getting some in is going to be better than none. And that's like where this stuff starts. Like, this stuff is in your hands. It's just a question of time. And, and I know I come, come on these and I say this stuff all the time. It's because I, I truly mean it. And I, truly believe it. And this is the same stuff I tell the folks that I work with. Um, so, you know, this, this is, this is what it is. And one of the best parts about being on social media that I have a very love hate relationship with in general is the fact that hopefully some of you will take some of what I'm saying, not think it's crazy and act on it. And, and, and that's ultimately what it is. Like the people who do the best, like if you saw my post yesterday, it's the people who are going to act um, and, and not wait and take action. So I hope that's you. All right. I got to run because I have a meeting at one o'clock. Um, but I hope, thank you for tuning in. Again, if you want an iris tongue fingernail analysis, I am offering them. The link is in my bio. You can check it out. Um yeah, I'd love to sit down. They've been actually a lot of fun to do. Very casual, very low key. Um, and yeah, we sit down and chat and go into a little bit more detail. So I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Uh, I will save this on Instagram. I'll save it on YouTube. Um, check out the blog, InsideOutHealthWellness.com. This will be all written out. See you guys next week. Have a good one.